Thanks for joining us, Wesley. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. So, I guess, given the title of what we're talking about today, the first question would be, what is risk reduction? Risk reduction is simply the objective of removing as much risk out of the business process going down during some kind of cyber event. So if you think about it from an, a risk analysis perspective, you're going to want to evaluate what kinds of risks are out there that could affect the way your business operates and what is the impact of those risks when they actually execute and what does that mean from a customer perspective, from a supplier perspective, from an employee's perspective and categorizing those risks in such a way that you can mitigate the ones that are going to cause the most damage to your business. Brilliant. And I guess, given the risks then, where does cyber resilience play a part in negating those those risks? Yeah. So we like to talk about uh, cyber resilience. Uh, we, we use we coin the phrase bounce back ability. So it's the effect. It is the effectiveness of how how easily the business can get back to being productive, to getting back to being able to invoice customers, transact orders, pay suppliers, pay payroll, um, in the event of an unforeseen cyber event. Yep. So cyber resilience is really doing everything you can to make sure that the business can continue to operate even when something unforeseen occurs to the business. Brilliant, and I guess from, from our point of view, working in, in cyber um, for quite some time now, we see that a lot of risks happen that are completely unforeseen. Yeah. Um, we have ransomware attacks, we have, which is of course is a malware attack. Um, but from an open text point of view, you've got quite a large portfolio yeah. um, of products. So which products from your set would suit sort of cyber resilience and um, the risk reduction? Well, cyber resilience is all about building layered security. Uh, like you say, the, the threat landscape is evolving at such a rapid pace. We don't know what we don't know in terms of future risks. So we have to try and hedge our bets and cover as many bases as we can. And the way to do that is by having a layered approach. So the portfolio that we have in order to support cyber resilience is really in three phases or three sections. The first section is all about um, data security. How do we prevent bad things from happening in the first place? What are the perimeters and the guard fences, the guardrails we can put up around our business to stop those bad things from happening? The second area that we focus on is how do we monitor and detect when something bad is happening? Because we have to assume that we're going to get breached, not a question of if but when, right? So when something is happening, how do we monitor and detect when something is going on at that time? And then the third piece is really that bounce back ability piece is, okay, something has got wrong, how do we get the business up and running again? And that's all about data protection. How do we get that data back into a state where we can transact again? How do we make sure that that data is, you know, has integrity and that it doesn't disrupt our, our business further down the line? So those three phases align to the three phases of a cyber attack. Yep. and we want to do what we can in those places to make sure we've got coverage as far as possible. Brilliant, and I guess from our customers' point of view, so our MSPs, our, our VARs, um, it wouldn't matter whether that's on-premise, whether it's in the cloud, as everything's moving to the cloud now, yeah. um, it wouldn't matter where that, that is stored, I guess. Well, where the data is stored, no, because every business is different. Yeah. Some businesses have sovereignty requirements or uh, regulation requirements where they have to look after data in a certain way. I think from, from our perspective, it's more about educating our, our customer base that we can't spend all of our budget just on securing things. We have to think about what happens further down the line when we get breached. Are we investing enough in those other areas? Brilliant. And I guess you said it's sort of we don't know what's going to happen next. But what trends are we currently seeing? What, what's out there now, I guess, for yeah. our partners? So, so we run a threat report uh, actually twice a year. We, we do a main report once a year, and then we supplement that with a mid-year update where we do exactly that. We analyze what are the trends that we're seeing. So, for example, two years ago, the big trend was business email compromise. Okay. Um, however, we're seeing a resurgence of phishing emails. So we've got all of those things going on, right? whether it's business email compromise, whether it's social engineering, or whether it's brute force attack. Um, or whether it's simply um, businesses not adopting a good hygiene policy and leaving the doors wide open for the perpetrators. So th those are the kinds of things that, that you know, we consistently see going on. Obviously, AI is absolutely having a dramatic effect on that. Not because AI is a new attack vector. It simply means that by leveraging AI technologies, um, threat actors can evaluate targets more rapidly, can spin up 
for example, phishing campaigns with compelling language in it without any typos or spelling mistakes, yeah. uh, and can and can broadcast out you know those various attacks, whether they be brute force attacks or whether they be um, DDoS attacks or whether they be IP port scanning. They can do these things at compute speed now because of the evolution of AI. So it's still the same threat vectors. It's still phishing. It's still IT hygiene. It's just that the threat actors are now being able to go much much quicker than they have been in the in the past because of the evolution of AI. Brill, and I guess from again speaking for our partners, um, they see Open Text as a as a big company now. You for us, it's still Webroot, it's Carbon Our Cloud Ally, etc. Um, if somebody is under attack from a, a malware attack, a brute force attack, DDoS attack, what products from the Open Text portfolio would sort of mitigate any risk yeah. there? Well, uh, the way we approach it, as, as I said, is all about layers, right? So we start by educating the end user. We, we can see dramatic reduction in phishing clicks simply by educating the users with 10 months of education four times a year on a regular basis, okay. just by bringing that awareness forward. Then we focus on the device that the user is working with, so endpoint security, making sure that we've got, uh, you know, uh, tools on there that can, like Webroot, like you mentioned, for example, that can detect when a script is running, that can look for memory resident applications that shouldn't be there and unwanted software applications. So protecting that device. Then, as you come down the stack, we want to make sure that the network is protected with DNS protection. So, you know, these are examples of layers that we put, starting with the user, then the device, then the network, and then we can move into the mon mon monitoring, the detection, and then we can start to layer on your data protection services. So whether that data is sitting on the laptop, the endpoint, or whether it's sitting on a server, or whether it's sitting in a SaaS application, we want to have layers of protection to make sure that that data can be recovered. How does an organization transition from reactive to adaptive cybersecurity? It's a good question, an interesting one. I'm not so sure there should be a transition. I think businesses need to be thinking about those proactive measures that we've discussed and start to evolve their thinking across into those reactive measures. So um, adding cybersecurity, or well, creating a cybersecurity posture that includes both data security and data protection together, rather than picking between reactive or proactive. You need to do everything. Okay, Woods, I'm gonna give you just a couple of scenarios that our customers and their customers face. Sounds fun, let's go. Um, so an employee receives an email that appears to be from a trusted source. Yeah but it's actually a phishing attempt. Of course, we all get those. Yeah. Um, and it's an attempt to steal sensitive information and credentials. Yeah. What do open text do to alleviate any stresses or strains from that scenario? Yeah, so it's a good question. So a phishing attack is basically an example of some kind of a social engineering attack, right? So um, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna train that, in, that end user to, to help them identify these kinds of emails and to make them aware that clicking on links that you're unaware of or that you're not familiar with from senders you're not you're not uh, familiar with is a bad idea and we do that by by delivering training to to those end users small bite-sized pieces of training no more than 15 minutes maybe uh, four times a year on a continuous basis and we see a dramatic reduction in the amount of clicking uh, events that we get um, based from from phishing emails that's the first thing we can do the second thing we can do is the objective of a phishing attack is really for to get the user to click a link in order to download some malware. And we can prevent that by monitoring what kind of DNS requests are being made from machines. So our DNS Protect product will basically evaluate every time that a, uh, a web resource is being reached out to, whether that be an IP address or a domain, uh, and we will automatically in real time scan to determine whether that is a safe link for that user to be get traveling to, and we can eradicate any downloads from those uh, malicious sites. So those are just two examples of, of how, uh, you know, two layers we can put in place in order to help us prevent uh, from being a victim of a phishing attack. Brilliant, thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned malware <laughs> because the next scenario yeah. kind of fits well into that. Yep. The recipient has clicked on the link on the email, so they haven't done the training right. whatsoever. Right. Um, malware has now infected their machine yep. um, and a ransomware attack has encrypted critical company data um, and it's demanding a ransom for its release. So again, open text response to that would be? Yeah, so the very first and foremost thing I want to say is that everyone is going to tell um, you not to pay the ransom. Because the minute you pay that ransom and you put money into the back pocket of these threat actors, um, it's going to do two things. The first thing is it's going to fund them. It's going to allow them to launch more attacks and the issues are going to propagate further. But secondly, you basically put a target on your back and said, hey everybody, I'm willing to pay a ransom, come and hit me again. So, so definitely don't pay the ransom. And that leaves uh, a very small number of things we can do to remediate from the situation. 
First and foremost, you want to back up your data. So no matter where the data is located, if it's on laptops and desktops in a remote kind of environment, you want to back that data up. And that can be tricky to do, especially with mobile workforces, people moving around. Information on servers, you want to make sure you back that up in a consistent manner. And even if you've got information in services like Salesforce or Google Workspace or Microsoft 365, you want to make sure you've got a, a good backup copy of that data as well. With that backup data, you can then always recover that and get your business operational again. And that's going to thwart any attempt from these threat actors to hold your information in ransom. You may also want to consider some high availability solutions as well in the event that it's a denial of service and they bring some of your infrastructure down, you may want to have some of those critical services fail over to a remote location so you can keep operational. Brilliant. So we're back full circle to the beginning and the yeah. bounce back ability that you mentioned. It's all about the bounce back ability. It's all about cyber resilience. Brilliant. So they're, they're the scenarios that I wanted to run through. Great. Um, just to give an understanding of how you can thwart any threats. Um, so I guess my next question to you is mm. what's next? We've seen AI, etc. but what do you see next? Well, I mean, AI is definitely going to be first, you know, front and center in terms of everything that we're doing. Fortunately, we've actually had uh, AI, or specifically machine learning, built into WebRoot for the last 10 years. And that machine learning has allowed us to build a huge repository of information about threats, the threat landscape, and for us to be able to uh, monitor and see what trends and attack vectors are changing over time with that historical data that we collected. So machine learning is already in the, 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 the portfolio that we offer. Um, at an open text level, we, we've just launched um, Open Text Aviator. This is going to be a large language model plugin into all of our services, specifically for cybersecurity as well. This is going to make it much easier for our um, for our security analysts, but also our partners and our customer security analysts to interact with the services that we're providing. So we're very, very focused on, on AI and making sure we get the, the best out of those technologies um, that we embed into our service. Also, as many of our partners are probably aware, we're slowly adding products into our secure cloud portfolio, giving them a single pane of glass, uh, giving them a wider access to a wider number of solutions to be able to address those, those layered components at their customers and give maximum protection to their customers. Brilliant. And I guess, as we're all aware, you've got a lot of competition out there. Mm -hmm. So now is your stage. Why open text? Well, I think you know, the strategy we've adopted is to have a, a, a wide variety of solutions to be able to allow our partners to deliver value into their customers by offering them whatever degree of layers in that security posture that they want to. Um, and you know, the, the more that you can provide to this one uh, portal uh, f from one supplier such as yourself, then the greater the economies of scale, the greater the margin that you're able to make, the easier it is to operate and administer the service. These are all savings that are going to flow down to, to your partners. Brilliant. Well, you've certainly made me understand risk reduction a lot better. So, Woodsy, thank you very much for your time. You're really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt.